Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, they, they say be careful about what you talk about at, at conferences because you might become known for them, but I'll say in that way I need to thank you because I'd be rather be known for mesh infections than for groin pain, I guess, uh, if I was to pick. It's a tough call, though. Great. My disclosures, I do some proctoring for Intuitive and also some observerships for ETEPs for, uh, for Gore. Um, so when I was thinking about this talk, you know, um, at the end of the day, it really kind of boils down to me to two basic questions. Uh, which of these meshes can I salvage? What situations can I salvage? And then what, if I can't salvage it, what do I do now? Um, these are really complex situations, and most of our techniques are completely focused on preventing this, right? And all of us fear, at the end of the day, the ultimate mesh infection. So this is a case here of a uh, patient who had a open retromuscular repair um, with subcutaneous flaps and ended up with a, uh, a wound like that. Ultimately debrided with exposed mesh. Um, just a show of hands, who in the room thinks that you can salvage this mesh? Okay, cool, interesting. We'll continue on. Next case, this is a patient who had an open intraperitoneal sublay with uh, Pryotex mesh a long time ago. Ultimately underwent a uh, subsequent laparotomy for appendicitis with a chronic wound right through the mesh. And he came to me with a um, with uh, several sinus tracts draining through the skin there. We tried, you know, a lot of debridement, negative pressure therapy, all that kind of stuff. Um, how many folks think that this is a salvageable situation? Chronic sinus tracts to the mesh in perineal position. Nobody. Um, and then finally, the third case, <clears throat> this is a patient who had a total abdominal colectomy for ulcerative colitis and end ileostomy. Had had two peristomal hernia repairs in the past, both um, intraperitoneal keyhole meshes, um, and then presented to the hospital with this situation. You can see there's the mesh and, uh, and an abscess around one of the two pieces of mesh in his abdomen. Anybody here think this is salvageable? Probably not. Um, so if you, if you read the textbooks, they classify mesh infections into a couple different categories, acute versus chronic infections. Uh, primary or secondary infections, meaning is it infected from the in initial operation or a secondary operation, much like that second case. Uh, and then also they divide these into skin or GI flora. However, when it comes to mesh salvage, these categories are not necessarily very helpful. So what do we really care about? Well, I do care about acute versus chronic um, infections because we know that the majority of these infections are going to be due to uh, gram-positive organisms about 60 to 75 percent of them, and about uh, half of those are going to be MRSA. So obviously these form biofilms, and chronic infections are going to be much more difficult to clear. Um, the location of the mesh really matters to me. Uh, is it intraperitoneal? Is it an onlay? Is it retromuscular? And then also the type of mesh. So we'll just kind of basically go through my initial algorithm. You know, first off, source control, open debridement, IR drainage, all that stuff, negative pressure wound therapy. Uh, and then fistula, fistula management and nutrition. And this is going to basically divide us into two categories. Either you're going to salvage that mesh, or you're going to turn an acute infection into a chronic wound or fistula. And then you've got to deal with that. Um, so this is a paper published in 2013. Um, it was a, uh, a, um, a, a series of about 57 patients who underwent an um, uh, attempt at um, salvage of their mesh. They had four, 54 of those meshes were uh, retromuscular meshes, and then uh, there was four of them that were intraperitoneal. Uh, or no, nine, sorry. All of the 54 were able to be salvaged with, uh, with open debridement and negative pressure therapy, um, and only six out of the nine intraperitoneal meshes were able to be salvaged. So this was kind of the first, uh, in my mind, uh, iteration of, well, some of these are going to be able to be salvaged and others will not. And that leads us to, um, to his paper published by Warren et al. Um, in AGS, or AJS, where he uh, looked at um, 213 attempts at mesh salvage and tried to determine which ones of these meshes were salvageable and why. Um, and basically, at the end of the day, there was two factors that affected mesh salvage. So the mesh type, you can see macroporous polypropylene had the highest rate of salvage, followed by microporous, and then multifilament, composite, and PTFEs were very difficult to, to salvage. And then the location of that mesh, right? So intraperitoneal meshes were very difficult to salvage. Preperitoneal, a um, little bit better, and retromuscular had the highest. And at the end of the day, they found that there was a 72.2% salvage rate um, of macroporous polypropylene mesh in the retromuscular space. 
So you do all that stuff and you still can't salvage the mesh, now what? And this is a much more interesting question because this is a, this is a difficult situation. Um, are you gonna do a complete mesh excision or are you just gonna excise part of that mesh? Are you gonna do a single staged repair, meaning closing the abdominal wall, or are you going to bridge that defect and then come back to find another day? And then uh, are you gonna, if you're gonna close that defect, are you gonna just do a primary repair or are you gonna reinforce that with some mesh of some sort? Um, so this is um, a paper published by uh, Vidra Augustine um, where she looked at comparisons of outcomes of partial versus complete mesh excision. So they did a uh, propensity matched two to one uh, through the AHSQC database um, of patients who underwent partial versus complete mesh excision. Uh, and in their unmatched cohorts, they found a higher risk of comp complications, SSOs, SSO PIs, as well as reoperation. And then when they matched those groups, there was still a higher rate of SSO PI and reoperation. And these were significant differences. Uh, you know, the number needed to treat here was 4.4 and 6.6. Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, if the mesh is infected, we need to remove the entire mesh. So then should we do a single staged or a, a single, or I guess should we do a primary repair or should we do a staged approach? And I guess when we're talking about staged approaches, we're really talking about bridging the defect, right? And then coming back to fight another day. Um, and so this is a paper <clears throat> uh, that was published where they looked at 43 single stage reconstructions versus a bridged approach. Obviously small numbers here, but it was kind of our first iteration of um, seeing that some of the, that really at the end of the day, you should close the abdominal wall if you can, right? The bridged repairs, 85% recurrence rate, we would expect that. Um, Non-bridge repairs, so these are somewhere primary, the majority of these were done with an underlay of biologic mesh, uh, and then retromuscular mesh. Overall, if you close the abdominal wall and reinforce it with something, you have a lower risk of recurrence, 21%. Um, so what about the retromuscular space? Should we be doing a retromuscular dissection in these patients? Well, this is a difficult question to ask. Um, you know, this, the, um, the COBRA study um, by Mike Rosen looked at 104 uh, patients um, who had um, uh, 104 patients where they did retromuscular sublay of absorbable mesh in contaminated fields. And 29 of these were actually due to infected mesh explantations. Um, 94 of them were placed in the retromuscular space and 10 were placed in the intraperitoneal space. And here they did find a lower risk of recurrence. Now, not all of these were due to mesh infection, uh, and they did have a 10% risk of SSI, which really at the end of the day is not super substantial um, in, the long, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so it's certainly a possibility. Um, however, do we really want to burn that bridge at the time? So um, what about permanent synthetic mesh? There's a lot of folks that want to talk about permanent synthetic mesh in contaminated and dirty fields but there's far fewer folks that are actually willing to do it in practice. And this was borne out in a study by, um, by uh, Jeremy Warren where they looked at <clears throat> um, management of, um, of uh, or where they looked at a mesh placement in contaminated fields. So hernia surgery in contaminated fields. And here you can see this bottom category is the dirty cases. Now unfortunately they didn't do a subgroup analysis of these dirty cases. Um, and so it's difficult to totally um, ascertain what was going on here. However, um, you can see about 23 of these patients out of the 82 uh, actually had permanent synthetic mesh placed in those fields. And 70 of those cases were due to infected mesh. Um, then we look at recurrence now at the bottom. Um, you know, only 5% only of the overall synthetic meshes were placed in this dirty field. So it's hard to look at recurrence here. But I think the most important thing here to me is that the recurrence rate between the primary repairs, which was the majority of those in the study, uh, were in the dirty field, <clears throat> or the biologic, uh, were about the same. So at the end of the day, you kind of have to ask yourself, am I really doing this patient much benefit by placing an expensive piece of mesh and complicating the situation at the time of mesh explantation? Um, and this was a great study that kind of addressed that. This is a retrospective review uh, of the VA um, where they looked at a large number of patients at the VA who had mesh explantations for infection. They had uh, 332 patients initially. 274 underwent a primary repair of the abdominal wall after explantation of that mesh. Some of those were done primarily, and then some were reinforced with mesh. So there's 118 that were actually reinforced with mesh. 
12 of those required a second explantation of mesh, right? Um, which is significant. Remember, at the end of the day, we need to remember that our primary goal in these operations is to rid the abdominal wall of infection or fistulas, right? If we end our operation and we still have a chronic wound, we still have infected mesh, or we have a persistent fistula, we have done that patient no good. So at the end of the day, I think our technique needs to be mainly focused at ridding the abdominal wall of infection. And this is a perfect example. This is actually a patient I saw right before I got on the plane to come over here, a patient who had a, um, a fistula to a piece of intraperitoneal mesh, um, had the fistula taken down uh, six months ago. And then the abdominal wall was repaired using an underlay of biologic, and then sub-Q flaps were raised and uh, an onlay of uh, biosynthetic mesh, right? Um, now we're six months later, and this patient's been dealing with a horrible chronic wound, and you can see a recurrent fistula. So have we done this patient any good by using fancy mesh and using fancy techniques? Absolutely not, right? And so in my mind, if you have not ridden the patient, if you've not gotten rid of their infection or their fistula, you haven't done them any good. So your technique is much more important to me um, than your uh, mesh choice, if at all. So here's the uh, continuation of that algorithm. So source control, negative pressure therapy, um, fistula management. <clears throat> this is gonna lead us either to mesh salvage or chronic wound or fistula. Then we have to figure out what we're gonna do from there. So complete mesh excision. The majority of these are gonna be intraperitoneal meshes, right? As we saw before, those are composite meshes, those are intraperitoneal, they have a low salvage rate. So the majority of these are probably gonna be intraperitoneal meshes. In that circumstance, complete mesh excision, and then I either do a primary closure or a sublay with some sort of absorbable mesh. Once again, trying to minimize the risk of complications. However, like I said, up at the top, if the bridge is already burning, I'll make some more. So if this is a retromuscular mesh, and I've already obliterated the mesh retromuscular plane, I will place a retromuscular sublay of absorbable mesh, um, because I think they'll have a lower recurrence rate, um, and ultimately, that's a well-vascularized plane. So how did those patients from the beginning do? Well, <clears throat> um, this patient, we were actually able to salvage this mesh, and a year later, um, does not have any signs of recurrent hernia. We uh, um, negative pressure therapy and skin graft um, is doing very well. This patient was a little bit more difficult, so <clears throat> I did do a complete mesh excision, and then I, I didn't have a huge defect afterwards, so I elected for just a primary closure of the abdominal wall. Post-op day two, he had a fascial dehiscence and evisceration. So to take him back to the operating room, left his abdomen open. Ultimately was able to close him with a primary closure and uh, an intraperitoneal sublay of absorbable mesh. And now he's six months out and doing well. Actually has no signs of infection and no signs of recurrence yet. I expect him to recur eventually though. Um, and this is the mesh that I excised. You can see several sinus tracks leading down to the mesh. Uh, and there's biofilm all over this mesh. Um, this patient um, did a complete mesh excision. Um, you can see there was two pieces of keyhole mesh, and you can actually see one of those has been eaten by the small bowel up at the top. Um, I did a closure, I, I actually recited his stoma to the other side, did a closure of the defect in the intraperitoneal sublay of absorbable mesh, um, and he's now six months out and actually doing very well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.